Would you pray with me? Jesus, we do pray that all glory would be to you. We, we thank you that you have made us singers, that we can rejoice in your goodness, that we can sing of your praises, that you have given us a new song in our hearts because you have saved us through your blood, your death in our place. So I pray that this morning we would remember that we can do nothing apart from you, that we would hear your word uh, as it comes from you, that we would submit under it as a worship unto you, and that Jesus, you would get all of the glory for what goes on here this morning. We pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Please be seated. And you can turn in your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This is the third part of a little mini-series that we've been doing on the Christian home, Ephesians 5 and 6. And one of the challenges that I feel in addressing such an important topic as the Christian home is that doing it so quickly leaves a lot uh, unsaid. Uh, there's a, uh, just a lot of issues that, that you wrestle through in, in marriage, in relationships, husband and wife issues. So I just want to encourage you to just to step in to the lives of others, to reach out. There are elders in this church who are uh, responsible for your spiritual care who would love to, to work through those things with you just to help you think through. I was talking to an older couple that's been married for 40 years, uh, actually this week, and they were, they were telling me about early in their marriage, they were convinced of what Ephesians 5 says about husband and wife roles. They were convinced of that, but they said it was, it was actually hard to see it lived out. They didn't know what to do because they were so young. So being in the life of the church, all of a sudden for them to have godly examples made all the difference in their marriage. So I just encourage you, uh, older saints that have walked this path to come alongside younger saints. Uh, if, you're, if you're new at this, if you are new to marriage, to parenting, to these things, find uh, someone who has walked this path. Find someone that can speak into your life on these things. Uh, just in this, this important topic, the, the Christian home. And this week we transition from husbands and wives to children and parents. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 this morning, children and parents. And I lead the, the youth ministry here at Grace Bible Church, the junior high and high school ministry. And I get asked the question, uh, fairly often I've been asked this question, uh, what, what have you learned leading the youth ministry? What have you learned uh, about parenting? What are things that you've, you've brought to your own parenting? Uh, our, our oldest is 13, right, right up at the bottom end of this spectrum of, of teenager. And so there is a, a lot of things that we can learn watching teenagers getting a, a front row seat, seat into their lives. I think the, the thing that, that sticks out in my mind, uh, what I've learned, what I've seen, is the, the difference between parents of young kids and the parents of teenagers is when you have young kids, you actually have this illusion that you're in control. You, you do, because you, you make all of these choices, all of these decisions, right? You drive the car everywhere. You choose what you're going to eat. You choose who their friends are. You choose how they're going to spend their time. Right? You, you do have a lot of control in that sense over their choices. And then as your kids get older, uh, you, you realize pretty quickly that you are not in control. As, as kids become, especially the later teenage years, and they start driving and making their own choices, and they start working and making their own friends, and you start to see good decisions, and you start to see poor decisions, and you start to see discernment, and you start to see a, a lack of discernment. You see where there are convictions of Scripture, and you see where there are a lack of convictions. Uh, you, you see all these mistakes that start to come out. Irrationality starts to come out. And you realize really quickly that you, you are not in control. Uh, when you're young, when you have young kids, you imagine that there is a, a program that you can, if you just do all of these things, if you just follow all of these steps, if you implement these methodologies, then out will come, out of the assembly line, will come mature godly kids. You imagine that when you have young kids. I just have to do these things and then, I, and then I'll produce mature, mature children. And then the, as you see older kids, you see teenagers. And then I think the difference between, if I had a, just to say the difference between parents of young kids in the church and parents of, of teenage kids, uh, one major difference is parents of young kids are much more confident in their parenting, much more confident in the, the methods of parenting. And what you see in, in parents of, of teenage kids as kids get older is you see a lot more prayer and you see a lot more dependence, dependence on the Lord, right? You see a, a lot more confidence in Scripture, right? Bible's open, uh, looking for wisdom, pleading with the Lord. What do I do next? Uh, we find out pretty quick in parenting that there is no, there's no program. There's no uh, one-size-fits-all approach. 
But what we do have is we have the scriptures, and we have confidence in the Lord, and we have God who sustains us and strengthens us. So I hope this morning that we can look back at the pages of our Bible and look at the, the principles, the truths that, that are going to drive parenting. And not a program, not a, not a method, but, but truth, God's truth, God's principles for parenting here in Ephesians 6. So let's read together Ephesians 6, these first uh, four verses, to, to children and to parents. Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And if you remember from a, a few weeks ago, this, this section sits under the banner of a, of a section here in Ephesians 5, back to Ephesians 5, verse 18, where Paul says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He's actually uh, encouraging the church. This is what it looks like to be filled with God's Spirit, to walk by the Spirit, to live a life, uh, you could say, in submission to the Spirit. And knowing what the, the Spirit uses, the Word of God, this is a, a life that is ruled by the Word of God. The controlling influence of your life is God's Word, empowered by His Spirit. And then he, he lays out what, what that looks like. You could just say basic Christian living. The, the attitudes and actions of a Christian, verses 19 through 21. You have speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So you find out Christians are a singing people, a rejoicing people. Verse 20, always giving thanks for all things. Christians are a thankful people. And then verse 21, we find out that, that Christians, uh, Christian living under the submission to the Holy Spirit, submission to the Lordship of Christ, Christians are a subjective people. Be subject. They are a submissive people. Be submissive to one another in the fear of Christ. So this is what a life that's uh, under the prevailing influence of the Spirit, submitting under God's Word, is a, a life that does not say, I, I am my own master, I am my own authority, but a life that is submitted under authority. And Paul here specifically in Ephesians 5 and 6 is going to bring this truth to the home. This is what it looks like to submit under the authority of Jesus Christ in your home. Uh, we looked at wives and, and husbands, and now children and parents. This is what it looks like for, for children in a home to submit under authority. This is what it looks like for parents to submit under authority. In children, you have this unique uh, place in the home to put the gospel on display. You put the gospel on display as you submit uh, under, under the authority of your parents in a culture that hates authority. If you read through uh, Romans 1, you think about Romans 1, the spiral of depravity in Romans 1, a culture that God gives over to sexual immorality, to further and further debauchery, a culture like we're in today. And what God highlights in Romans 1, you get to, to verse 30, you have all these sinful acts, you have murders, you have hate. But what's highlighted in there is also disobedience to parents. This is what a, a godless culture does. They hate authority. So Christians in the home, children, have an opportunity to be a, a light in a dark world as, as you submit under the authority of your parents. So we're going to look at some principles for, for the Christian home, principles for both parents and children. So this morning, six principles to guide family life. Six principles to guide family life. Again, these are principles, not a, not a program, not three steps, but principles. We say principles, we mean uh, timeless truths. Timeless truths derived from God's word that, that shape us, that form us. Uh, truths that should impact how we, we live every day. And the, the structure of this passage is a pretty straightforward structure. If you look at the passage, you have two commands to children. <coughs> children, obey and honor, verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, you have a, a promise, really some motivation for obedience. And then you have two commands for, for parents, really for fathers. Do not provoke, but rather bring them up. So two commands to children, two commands to parents. But, but what I'm doing here is really this is two sermons in one, uh, bringing to just the, the principles. What are the principles in view here? What are the principles that, that guide family life? Uh, first principle here. Uh, from verse 1, families live under authority. Families live under authority. 
you see the authority structure here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is a command to children, obviously with implications to parents. So children must do this, and parents must require this. So uh, parents are under the uh, authority of Jesus Christ, and children are under the authority of their parents, under the authority of Jesus Christ. So parents must give instruction, and children must obey that instruction. The children must submit to parents as an act of submission to Christ. And parents must require this. They must require obedience. Uh, a student asked me uh, last week or the week before, how, how should I listen to this series? What, what are some takeaways as I listen on, on husbands and wives? Well, today you don't have to, to work that hard for application. If you are a child in the home, this, this verse is to you. One of the, the few verses in the New Testament you have Colossians 3.20, you have Ephesians 6, 1 and 2 that are written to children in the home. Paul addresses you individually. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is your obligation. This is God's will for your life. You wake up tomorrow morning, what is God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? Well, here's what he says. He wants you to obey your parents. This is the, the one instruction to rule all, all other instructions that you obey, you, you submit under the authority of your parents. In the home, this, this training ground, this safe place where, where you get to, to learn, you make mistakes, you have a, a soft landing, you have help and instruction and guidance. You have people that, that love you, especially in the church here, people that love you, that want to encourage you, that want to point you to the truth. And he says here to do this in the Lord. You could say under the banner of serving the Lord. Uh, as worship of the Lord. This is how you worship Jesus Christ. This week, you be a worshiper in your home by obeying your parents. That's what it looks like to worship. And he says, for this is right. Uh, in God's eyes, it is right. This word right is to say righteous, uh, according to God's standard. This adheres with God's revealed will. God, God says it's right. Colossians 3.20 says it pleases God. This is what is pleasing to the Lord. So you don't just obey because you agree. You don't just obey because, uh, because of consequences. I don't want to get in trouble. You don't just obey when, only when you're convinced of it, only when you feel like it. You don't say, no, you have to prove it to me before I obey. You, know, you obey because it is right. In God's eyes, it is right. God says it is right. And all of the parents in this room are imperfect parents. The only kind of parents you can get are imperfect parents. We see that in verse 4. There is a clear instruction to, to parents not to misuse their authority. Paul, Paul is saying here there's going to be a tendency for parents to sin, to actually parent in a way that's unhelpful. <clears throat> but that is not an, an excuse for disobedience. It's not an excuse to disregard God's clear command. And the same with a, a wife's submission to a husband. This is under the banner of, of God's will, God's law, so the second uh, a parent, the second any authority steps outside of God's law, uh, an authority tells you to sin, to actually sin against the Lord, right, they, they've stepped outside their sphere of authority. You don't have to obey. You don't, you don't obey when it's sin. But everything else, everything else that parents require, you, you obey because it is right. In God's eyes, it is right. We used to tell our kids when they were little that there's a, a, a circle of safety. I think we got this from Barb and Denny Pagel. But there is a, a circle of safety here. And you step out of this circle of, of safety, the, what your parents have told you, and you disobey. We're going to discipline you. We're going to bring you back in. This is a safe place for you to be under the authority of your parents. And for parents to, to remember that, that God has given this authority and you are under authority. You are obligated to require obedience so your, your kids must know every time that I disobey my parents, I sin against the Lord. And you must feel this weight as well, that when they disobey you, they sin against the Lord. So, so don't let them disobey. You know, we can't control them, right? I'm not saying that we can control their disobedience, but when they disobey, right, we, we bring them back. We give consequences. We want to inform them that this is sin, we don't just let it go unchecked, right? You see anyone in sin, you don't let it go unchecked. You don't ignore it. You don't give them eight, eight, eight chances. Oh, just keep saying the same thing. No, when you give an instruction, now they actually are required to obey it. We actually have to bring them under this authority. We have to help them. We have to, to teach them what it looks like to obey. 
So you have here uh, this authority and this responsibility that comes with it for a parent. Uh, stewardship. Our, uh, our sister-in-law, my wife's sister, had her first uh, baby yesterday. And uh, it was really, really exciting for us. And just to think about, you, you start remembering the, the first, first baby, the first time at the hospital. You know, your first kid, all of the first that you have. And you're, you're so excited for your, your kid to walk. I'm so excited for him to, to run and to throw a ball. All of these firsts. And now we have our, our fourth child. And she's five. The youngest is five. And, and I feel completely opposite. I want her to stop growing. I want her to stay little. I tell her at least once a week, you have to stay little. And she says, no, daddy, God is growing me. I can't help it. <laughs> but, but you feel that as, as your kids get older, right, you feel the, the weight of this responsibility because you see how quick it goes. You see how fast it goes. You see how much instruction you need to give them when they're in the home. So there is a, a stewardship here, a responsibility, because we are under God's authority. We are accountable to, to hold them under authority. So this is a, just a principle for the home. Children, obey. Parents require obedience, and children, you must obey. When you give instruction, they must listen. And we can't let them train them that, that disobedience doesn't matter. You know, actually inform their conscience, deaden their conscience to God's instructions. It, it's not that big of a deal. Well, this is what God says. If this is what God says, we want to train our kids to have tender consciences to God's word, to God's instruction. And there's a question that comes up, well, what if, what if my kids are unbelieving? You know, this is written presumably here, it seems like, to, to believing kids. When he says, obey your parents in the Lord, you know, as one who is united to Christ, this is written to believers. What if they're unbelievers? Do I still require obedience? How do I require obedience of someone that, that doesn't believe Christ? Well, I, to answer that, I was thinking about a, a conversation I had with my uh, eight-year-old the other day where he asked the question, uh, Dad, how do we know the Bible is true? How do we know the Bible is true? It's such a great question. Hard question to answer. Uh, you know, one way you can answer this, I think, is the person of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, fulfilled all of the promises of the Old Testament about a Messiah, who was killed, who walked out of a grave who is alive in heaven. You have to answer with the person of Jesus Christ, and he has spoken. That's, you know, that's a way to answer that question. But what I said to him, I, I answered it this way. I said, I said, we know the Bible is true because God says it's true, because God wrote it. And he says that every word he speaks is true. The sum of his word is truth. And I said, furthermore, you know that God is true because you have a conscience. Because in your conscience, when you sin against God, when you're deceitful and you feel guilty, you know there is a God because he has put his law in your heart. Because he has actually, in your heart, informed you, in your heart of hearts, that when you sin, you've rebelled against the king of heaven. You know this is true because you have a conscience. And you know there is a God. You know that he is judge. And this God has spoken. And this God has given us his word. And he's given us instruction. And he's given us hope of eternal life. So you, you must listen to this book because it comes from God, because, because God is true. And this reality, uh, it hit home for me years ago. I remember asking, uh, I was talking to a, a pastor who, who was talking about someone, an unbeliever, coming to him for marital counseling. Someone who said, hey, I'm not part of the church, I don't believe the Bible, but I need help, my marriage is falling apart. And I remember asking uh, this pastor, well, what did you say? He doesn't believe the Bible. How did you help him? And he said, I, I opened the Bible and I pleaded with him to, to go after his wife. I pleaded with him not to leave his wife because God hates divorce. And I, and I opened up Ephesians 5 and I, and I instructed him, this is what God says about marriage. It doesn't matter whether or not he has accepted it. It doesn't matter whether or not he's embraced it. Jesus is Lord of believers and unbelievers. Or we are teaching our kids, whether they're two years old or 50 years old, we are, we are teaching them that, that Jesus is Lord, whether or not you've accepted that reality, whether or not you've humbled yourself under that reality. Jesus is Lord. Right? Every knee will bow under the authority of Jesus. So every time we instruct them, we, we command them to obey, we are teaching them there is a God in heaven. He has spoken, and you are accountable to this God. This is what we're teaching them. And you see in verse 2, this is not just, just external acts, just feigned obedience. God requires much more for children 
than just going through the motions. Look what he says in verse 2. Honor your father and mother. Honor them. Now, this brings us to the, the second point here, not just the external conformity, but God's going after both actions and attitudes. God requires honoring attitudes. Second principle here, that, that your attitude matters, both what you do and how you do it, you could say. You think about obedience and honor this way, the, the attitudes and actions. You must do this, and there is a way that you must do it. You must do it in an honoring way. So how you treat your parents, children, matters. How you respond to their instruction. How you talk about them. How you think about them, even. How you talk about them to your friends. The honor is to, to revere, to have reverence, deference, trust, devotion, respect. We used to, to tell our kids to, to obey right away, all the way, with a happy heart. I think that was a dim, dimmeristism. Right away, all the way with a happy heart, or, or to say without complaint. You know, do this with an honoring attitude. To, not to sulk, right? Don't sulk after instruction. Don't grumble. Don't manipulate with your attitude. Don't give a mom a, a cold shoulder when you're upset. That's not respectful. You know, an attitude that says, an honoring attitude that says, I want to, to submit under your authority. I want to respect your authority because God has given it. In a disgruntled attitude, it is sinful. It is a sinful attitude, displeasing to the Lord. So again, for parents to, to not let this go unchecked, to not say, hey, it's just, it's okay. No, they, they need to honor mom and dad. This is what God requires of them. To honor is to, to respect, do their position. Give them respect, do their position because God has given it. And this is the, the Christian life. We are teaching them what it looks like to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ. Right, a follower of Christ is always one who is under authority. We are always one doing the will of another. We, we are never autonomous, just doing whatever we want to do. We are submitted under the lordship of Christ, and we are teaching them these principles as they submit under the instruction of parents. We are teaching them. This is what it looks like to have a, an honoring heart. And you know, Jesus uh, gives a command. He actually rebukes the Pharisees. Uh, in Matthew 15, also in Mark 7, he rebukes the Pharisees for not honoring their parents uh, later in life. And this command goes much further than in the home. Obviously, obedience, requiring them to obey in the home, but honor an attitude of respect for all of life to your parents, to be reined in for all of life, that I must always honor them, must always give them this attitude, because it shows a, a respect under the authority of Christ. And we can't make them want to honor. We can't change their hearts. You, you know this. You can't make them have a a happy heart, an, an obedient heart, from the heart obedience. But what we can do, what we must do, is impress truth into their conscience. Impress truth deep into their soul so they know what God says. They know what he requires. So they feel pain when they disobey. That they know there are consequences. And in verse 3, Paul gives us a, a principle, a truth, that we can impress deep down in their soul. The third principle here, that choices have lasting consequences. Choices have lasting consequences. And I pull this from verse 3, this, this promise. He says at the end of verse 2 that this command, this is actually uh, from the Ten Commandments, the fifth command, honor your parents in the Ten Commandments. He says this is the first command with a promise. I think first in order of importance. You know, I think for us in, in a home, the command that we give to our children more than any other command Ephesians 6, 1 and 2, we, we say this one the most. Children, obey your parents. This is what you're required to do. But this is the, the first commandment with a promise. There is a, a positive outcome here for obedience. And he says in verse 3 that, that it may go well with you, that you may live long on the earth. This is the promise. If you obey, there is, there is blessing for you. There is blessing for the, the people of Israel when Moses gives this instruction the Ten Commandments, that life will go well, you will live long on the earth. This is the land, that the land of Israel will be blessed as children come under the authority of their parents. The whole nation will be blessed. We'll have a nation of those who, under the fear of the Lord, are actually submissive to their parents. And individually, they will be blessed. Life will go well. Your future will go well as you learn how to submit under authority. And the inverse is also true. You could say it the other way. It will not go well for you if you do not submit. If you do not learn these principles of authority, 
If you do not learn what it looks like to, to respect and honor authority, life will be hard for you. Life will not go well for you. There will not be blessing for you. There is no safety for you in, in a rebellious heart, an anti-authoritarian heart. And just consider here just the, the kindness of the Lord uh, to give us a, a motivation. You know, the motivation, because it is right, he already told us in verse 1. But there is also blessing. God blesses the obedience of his children. And here is the, the principle, again, this principle, that your choices have consequences. A blessing of obedience, consequences for disobedience. You could say it this way, that you reap what you sow. This biblical principle of sowing and reaping. What you sow in your early years of life, you will reap. If you sow a heart that hates authority, a heart that despises instruction, you will reap that later in life. You will, you will find hardship and pain. And if you sow a, a heart that is submissive, that is humble under authority, that learns self-denial, you will reap fruit. You set patterns in your heart for the rest of your life. And there is a, a thrust here, you see, for personal responsibility, for children to take responsibility for their actions. Right? Your parents make a lot of choices for you, but you are responsible for how you respond. You are responsible for your own soul before the Lord. They're responsible for how they raise you, for how faithful they have been, and you are responsible for your own choices. Yeah, this is a principle we, we must instill in our kids. And it's been interesting to see the difference uh, in the, the youth ministry and then our young adults ministry, the college and career ministry. Because you see the, what happens once a, a kid in the church gets out of high school. And all of a sudden, they have to take personal responsibility for their, their life in the church. All of a sudden, mom's not making them show up every Sunday night. And you see just the, the fruit of those things. What is going on in their own heart is they have to decide for themselves what does it look like for me to serve in the church? People aren't, aren't going after me every time. They're not forcing me to be here. And you start to see this play out. Do they take personal responsibility for their own soul? Have these things stuck? And this is what we're trying to instill in our kids, to take responsibility, that you are accountable before the Lord. You must take responsibility for your soul, for your own choices. And we live in a society, I don't have to tell you, but, but we live in a society that, that pushes against this. Every area of society doesn't want to take responsibility for actions. Uh, it infiltrated for us even sports. Sports team recently, I heard, I heard this, this saying. It was said that every player deserves to be a starter. Every player deserves to be a starter. And I thought, well, what about the, the kids that, that worked hard in the offseason? What about the kids that, that have improved? What about the kids that are actually better than the other kids because of their hard work? You know, are, we, are we teaching them the value of hard work? that they, they reap what they sow. And it's infiltrated more than just sports. I mean, you think about just the, the evil of abortion in this country. The evil of abortion, that there are a million babies in this country murdered every year because people don't want to take responsibility for their choices. I mean, this is, as parents, what we, we must instill in our kids, that your actions have consequences. Every time we discipline, this is what we're teaching them. We're teaching them that sin leads to suffering. Your sin will lead to suffering. I want to I give you a reminder of this. I want to teach this to you. I want to impress it on your soul so that, that you realize, again, there is a God and he has spoken and that you are accountable to him. And this is what we are instilling. God gives parents to help children in this endeavor, to teach them this truth. There is a blessing for obedience and there, is a, there are consequences for disobedience to instill this in their heart. In the first three verses here written to children, I think similar to the, the instruction to wives. You, you read the instruction to wives, and it actually raises the accountability for the husbands. When you're saying, submit to what kind of leadership? Well, the same here for the parents. When you're telling children to submit under their parents, to obey their parents. As parents, it forces us to, to ask the question, well, how is my leadership in the home? Am I making it hard or easy for them to obey? Am I, am I adding obstacles? Am I uh, an impediment to this? And we see here in verse 4 that, that parents can actually, can actually be an impediment to the obedience of their children. They can actually be a hindrance to the obedience of their children. He says in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That You can actually be unhelpful in this. 
So we have an opportunity as you look at verse four to, to ask the question, how is my leadership in the home going? How am I doing at this God-given obligation? How am I doing at, at wielding this authority? Uh, verse, uh, principle number four here, coming from verse four, is that parents will always model. Parents will always model. And what I mean by model is that parents will be an example. Parents will always be an example to their children. You will be an example, whether you realize it or not, whether you're cognizant of it or not. The question is, what kind of example? What model are you setting? They are watching. You know, they are watching your, your conversations. They know what you prioritize. They know what you, what you love to talk about. They know what you spend your money on. They know how you respond to, to adversity and conflict. They know how you interact with your spouse and the way that you communicate. So children are always watching their parents. The question is, what kind of model, what kind of example are you being? You, you are an example. What, what kind of example? And you know this, but you can undo a lot of your teaching, a lot of your instruction in the home, if you live in a way that, that doesn't adhere, doesn't agree with your teaching. Just think about someone that's telling their kids to, to submit under authority. You must submit under authority. And then they go home and they complain about every authority in their life. And they complain about their boss. And they complain about the government. And they're saying, no, 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 submit under authority because God, is, God has given it to you. And what are you, what are you modeling for them? And he says here in verse 4, fathers, do not provoke. Do not provoke your children. Do not make them angry. Uh, do not push their buttons, you could say. Uh, Colossians 3.21, a parallel passage says, do not exasperate your children so that they would not lose heart. So you have here uh, provoking, exasperating, making them lose heart, making them angry because of the way that you parent, uh, irritating them, embittering them. And I say this is done through modeling because no, no Christian parent wants to make their kid angry. And if, you, if you love Christ, if you're uh, one of his children, you, you have a genuine desire to please the Lord. And of course you have a desire to love your children. You want your children to love Christ. You want them to have a godly character. So this isn't something that we do intentionally. No parent is saying, I want angry kids. This is something we do unintentionally. This is something we do by the way that we treat our kids. This is something we do by the way that we parent. And it's so helpful for us to, to see this because it forces us to be aware that there are, there are things in our lives, there are things that we do in our parenting that can be a hindrance to, to our kids, that can be unhelpful, destructive even. I mean, the obvious things to like yelling at your kids. I mean, if you're yelling, if you're stirring up anger, you know, in any, any, in any uh, conflict, right, you get two parties and it just escalates, right, to actually just stir the pot of anger with your kids through, through, through your own anger. I mean, that's a, an obvious way to provoke anger. Or, or belittling them, discouraging them, demeaning them, you know, making them feel small, making them lose heart, you know, making them feel that you have broken my standard, right? We want them to, to feel the weight of God's standard, not feel the weight that, hey, you have sinned against me. No, you, you've sinned against the Lord. I'm just his messenger. But there's, a, there's more subtle ways. There's a, a book at our book table that Lou Priolo has written called The Heart of Anger. And he has uh, in there, these, it says 25 ways that parents can exasperate their kids. Uh, I would encourage you, you can go, if you want some uh, convicting reading this afternoon, you can Google, just Google that. 25 ways parents exasperate their kids. And he, he just lists all of these ways, all these different ways, things that you wouldn't think of uh, off the top of your head, but, but I think just so helpful for us to consider. Some of these, he says, to be overly controlling. You're overly controlling of your kids in such a way that you give them no freedom. You don't let them learn. You don't let them even make mistakes. You, know, you think about the 17-year-old the that's not even allowed to go get the mail out of the mailbox because mom is too afraid of what might happen. Right? At some point, you're just going to stifle their growth. You're going to frustrate them. Uh, he talks about uh, inconsistent parenting. You just said different standards day to day. Today, we're going after this. And then the next day, well, I forgot about that thing I said yesterday, but we have a new, a new priority today. And then the next week, a new priority. Inconsistent parenting. It's confusing. Confusing to the kid. Exasperating in that way. And I think if you were just to, to sum these up, what is exasperating to kids is hypocrisy. To, to say one thing and to do another. To live a hypocritical life. That is exasperating to a child. To say, this is God's commands, and, I, and I'm not concerned with obeying it. I'm going to pretend like I obey it. And you know that, that parents are sinners. We're not, 
We're not putting a, a false piety in front of our kids. But what do kids need to see from their parents is a repentant lifestyle. They need to see a, a parents that keep short accounts with sin. Uh, the Christian, the difference in regards to sin between the believer and the unbeliever is not that they have sin. It's what do they do when they see sin in their life. The believer, they confess it. They grieve over it. They forsake it. Our kids need to see us model this. Model a confessing, repenting lifestyle. And for kids, this, this instruction to parents, do not provoke your kids, is not an opportunity to, to pull out, I think of the soccer, pulling out the yellow card and saying, no, you're provoking me. I don't have to obey. Right? This is not an opportunity for you to, to call out your parents. Right? You obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. But for parents to evaluate, how is my parenting? Am I, am I being inconsistent? Maybe in the right ways to ask, are there, are there ways I make it hard? I mean, you could ask your wife this, husbands. Are there ways I make it hard to follow? And even ask your kids, are there things that I, that I do that make it hard to follow? Are there inconsistencies you see in my life? So this is a high bar for parenting, to, to be a model, to be an example all the time in the way that you work, in the, in the way that you relate to your spouse, in the way that you approach life in the church, in the way that you approach the word of God, the way that you pray, all of these things we model to our kids. And we can make it hard. We can be a discouragement for them. But here, the, the opposite, verse 4, and instead of being this discouragement, instead of provoking them, what should we do instead? We, we bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that brings us to the, the fifth principle. Fifth principle here for home life is that children must be shepherded. Children must be shepherded. So to, to not model poor behavior, hypocrisy, but now you proactively, you teach. And, and I love the word shepherding, just to think about the, the biblical concept of a shepherd, a spiritual leader. I mean, that is the word for pastor, a spiritual leader that's feeding and leading his children, a father. And obviously, people can push that too far in terms of the father being the, the pastor of his family. But, but you think about the, the father being this, this chief person in the family to instruct, to care, to provide, to give spiritual nourishment to his children. And you do see in verse 4 that he is, he is addressing the fathers, right? Verse one, children obey your parents. Use the word for parents. Verse two, honor your father and mother. But verse four, you have a, a singular focus on the father. Not that mothers aren't involved, but I think emphasizing the leadership of a father. Back to Ephesians five twenty three, that the, the husband is the head of the home, is the leader of the home. So here the father must lead in this. He must set the, the direction in this. He must provide the stability in this. He must uh, provide the, the, the biggest spiritual influence in the home. And you realize that, that mom is usually home more during the day. All right, so to, to think about this instruction to fathers, knowing that mothers are going to spend probably more time with their kids. So how does this play out? I mean, what are some implications of that for us as dads? Well, that means we have to be in lockstep with our wives. We have to be in constant communication. How is parenting going? We have to be uh, encouraging and strengthening her. We have to help direct her. We have to have a pulse on family life, a pulse on the, how are the kids doing? How are the different uh, issues with each kid? When the dad needs to know these things. He needs to help set a, a course, a path for each of these things, to help encourage the wife and pray for the wife, with the wife in these things. And it also means, dads, when you're home, that, that you are the, the chief, the lead disciplinarian. You lead in discipline. You lead in instruction. You open the Bible and you teach your kids. So fathers and mothers, but, but fathers with the, the leadership here. Do not provoke, but bring them up. And he says, uh, do not provoke, you know, to fathers. The, the fathers are the, are the ones maybe primarily guilty of this, that are, that are most tempted toward this. And you could think about just the, the heavy-handed father, but I think what's What's more likely, what happens more often in the church is just a passivity of fathers to leave a, a wife and children floundering because of a lack of leadership. So here, fathers do not provoke, but bring them up proactively. Get after it. Bring them up. Nurture them. To, to bring them up from, from childhood to maturity. To raise them so that they can leave the home on their own. 
uh, this word that he uses for bring them up. It's the same word uh, back in Ephesians 5, when he says that, uh, Ephesians 5, 29, that Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. The, the word nourish, you know, nourish there from Christ to the church to bring a, a spiritual food, sustenance, to bring life to the church, to provide spiritual vitality to them. So this is the word bring them up, to nourish them. And you see the, the, the culture, the climate here. The, you could say maybe the, the soil for which this happens in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, I heard a, a dad recently just talk about just how he thinks about parenting his kids. I thought it was really helpful. He just said he breaks it into thirds. And you have the, the first third of their life, zero to six years old, zero to seven years old. And you're just laying this foundation of, of authority that they need to obey. You're laying a foundation that they are required to submit. And as they get into this next stage, you call it maybe six to 12 years old. Now you're starting to instruct them a lot more. You're starting to teach them. You're starting to train them. This is what it looks like. Give them some responsibility, help them. And, and as they become a teenager, now you're, you're giving them responsibility and you're, you're watching what they do and you're walking alongside of them and you're helping them think through decisions so that they can, they can leave the home and be a, a responsible adult, a discerning adult all under the banner of, of we want them to be God-fearers, to be ruled by the authority of Scripture. So we, we raise them up. It says in the, the discipline and instruction, uh, the, the discipline here, this is a word to, that means uh, to, to tutor or to train. The same word used in 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, Paul says that all Scripture is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and then training. This word, training in righteousness. Think about training your kid to, to ride a bike. I'm teaching them, I'm training them, but I'm training them in righteousness. I'm training them what it looks like to, to live a life under submission to Christ. I'm training them how to work hard, uh, practical skills, lifelong skills, training them what it looks like to, to be a mom, to be a wife, I'm training them what it looks like to be a worker. There is a, a training, a discipline, not just consequences. You think about that word discipline, just negative. This isn't just negative, this is positive. You're instructing, you're teaching, you're helping them build habits. And he says uh, the word instruction is also, you could translate it as admonishment. This word admonish in the New Testament. Uh, literally to put into the mind, to put truth into the mind. That's what this word instruction means. That you're, you're actually correcting wrong thinking with truth. You're saying, hey, you've gone off in this way. Let me correct that with truth. Let me put truth into your mind. Let me help you think rightly about this issue. So this is the, the discipline and instruction, both uh, hands-on, practical. I want to help you and you're teaching, Bible open. This is what it looks like to be godly. Let me correct wrong thinking. Let me help you get back on track. Uh, you have positive and negative, right? Negatively, you're correcting. When they sin, you tell them, you correct them, you protect them, you discipline them, you teach them. This is what it looks like. Let me show you. And to put truth into the mind, obviously the, the, the basis for this, all of this, requires us to, to know the scripture, to have our Bibles open, to say, I want to help you think God's thoughts. You know, as this book is God's worldview, I want you to think what God thinks about the world. So we are, are motivating them with truth. We are bringing truth to the mind, not, not beating them down, but raising them up in the truth. Uh, parents as, as motivators. I love to think about pastors. You think about the, the role of a pastor as a motivator. You know, what's the pastor? Not, not cheap motivation, not, not, not a false hope, not a self-help motivation, but to motivate people with God's word to love Christ more. Well, that's what, that's what a parent is doing. They are motivators. I want to motivate you toward love of Christ, toward submission to him. I want to I motivate you. I want to help come alongside of you to think of yourself that, that way, not as the one that's, that's tearing them down, but the one that's building them up, that's strengthening them. You have God's word as the, the fuel. And as a, a shepherd, I think about a shepherd's crook to, to bring them back when they disobey, to bring them back on the right track, to bring them back into to safety. And we realized when our, when our kids were young, and there's a lot more uh, discipline that goes on. And, and there's something that happens when, you're, when your kids are young and you and you're, you're, feel like you're constantly disciplining. And what happens is you, you have, every time it feels like the Bible is open, is, is negative. Let me tell you about how you didn't obey this. Let me tell you about this consequence. And all of a sudden, the, the Bible becomes just this book we use in, in discipline in, to bring consequences. 
And I just remember thinking about that after a couple of years in of like, man, I don't, I don't want them to, every time I open the Bible, to feel like, oh, this is the just, just consequence, Bible open, but actually to say, no, this is what we're always teaching. Let's instruct you and teach you scripture positively. And then when there is a consequence, when you've gone off track, remember that, that thing we talked about last night. Remember that, that passage we read last week. This is why what you're doing doesn't conform to that passage. To proactively teach them, to train them. And this is a, a monumental, a weighty task, really a, an all-consuming task. And if you haven't found yourself yet on your knees pleading for help, if that hasn't happened to you yet, it, it will. I think about all the, the moms, they joke about the moms in, in student ministries. Once their kids get their driver's license, that's when the, the praying really starts for the moms. And they, all of a sudden, they have to let their kids, okay, you're driving here for the first time by yourself. So this is, a, this is a weighty task. This is a prayerful task. And he ends this here in Ephesians 4 with the, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Of the Lord. You could say as prescribed by the Lord. Or in the, the power and the strength of the Lord. Again, under the banner of walking by the Spirit. Under the banner of being submissive to the Spirit. And this is not something we do in our own strength. This is something we do with the, the strength that God supplies. To have God at the, the center of our parenting. To realize these children, they don't belong to us. They don't belong to us. These are, these are a gift from God for a short period of time while they're in my home. I love Jim, Jim Elliott when he's going off to the mission field. He writes a letter to his mom and he, and he says, he talks about children, the, the, the psalm that talks about children being like arrows. Having a quiver full of arrows. And he just says to his mom, what are arrows for but to shoot? You can't keep them. They're not yours. And, and we know this. We know we aren't in control. We aren't in control. We never were. And what we have is principles from God's word. And the last principle here, a banner over our parenting, as we think about to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, is the Lord ruling over all of our parenting uh, to not to imagine that if we do all of these things, if we go through all of these tasks and we put these things in front of them and we teach them and we, we instruct them, if we do all of these things right, then out will come mature, godly children. That is not how it works. So we must have this, this last point over, as a banner over our parenting. Number six, that salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That God is the one who opens hearts. Or we have no control. We have no control of whether or not our, our children will embrace the gospel. We are not the Holy Spirit. We have his tool. We have his means that he uses. We have the very word of God, the sword of the Spirit. But God must open hearts. We have to remind ourselves this again and again. That this is a work of God. The salvation of your kids is a supernatural work of God that he saves whom he will save. He has mercy on whom he will have mercy. This is not something we get to, to choose. It's not something we can, we can actually manipulate God. If, well, I did all these things, Lord, and now you owe it to my kids. No, this is an act of God's grace, unmerited favor to sinners. And we must keep this in front of ourselves as we parent, that salvation belongs to the Lord. As I think back just to, yeah, what I've learned uh, teaching the, the students, being in student ministries the last two years, I think this truth above all others, uh, just to remind myself again that salvation belongs to the Lord. I mean, you see as, as kids come into high school in the church, I mean, you, you do see uh, the fruit of, of good parenting. And you see parenting weaknesses. Yeah, they, they come out in high school for sure. But, but you also see, you see faithful parents that have unbelieving kids. You see two kids from the same home and one of them loves Christ and one of them doesn't. Same parents, same home life, same instruction. So we must believe this, that salvation belongs to the Lord. That, that a Christian home is a dependent home. A home that's dependent on the, the Spirit of God. That's dependent on the grace of God. That it is a needy home. And, and as you hear that, hopefully that does for you what it does for me, is that actually you could be discouraged by that. Well, what, what am I doing then? There's, there's no use. But what it should do is it should actually give you uh, energy and zeal because we have the very word of God. 
God's power for salvation, we have that. We get to declare that in our homes. We get to do that again today. And we have access in prayer to the very throne of grace. And we believe in a God who loves to save sinners. So as you think about just the salvation belonging to the Lord, that should fuel us to be more prayerful. That should fuel us to to bring God's word more often to our kids, to say, this is the power. I have no power in myself. That should make us uh, dependent parents, not confident in our efforts, but but confident in the Lord, Uh, prayerful, humble people with Bibles open, pleading with the Lord for help in this task. And this is where the the church comes in. All of us together have an opportunity to strengthen each other in this, to, to strengthen each other as we go after this next generation. I think about just what goes on on the other side of this, this building on Sunday mornings. All of the kids over there hearing truth week after week, hearing God's word from faithful servants, and at the same time, no, no power in themselves to believe. And what we have in this room is we have a room full of those who love Christ. We have a, a room full of prayers that can, that can go to God in prayer and plead for the salvation of the next generation in this church. And you are armed with the, the word of God, the, the very power of God for salvation, his gospel message. And you have access to the throne of grace. So together as a church, we lock arms in prayer with God's word to, to go after this, this all-important task, raising up another generation in the church who would fear the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, we feel our, our weakness in this task. We feel our frailty in this task. We feel our, our dependence. And if we don't, if we're self-confident, Lord, I pray that you would just wreck us of our self-confidence so that we would uh, just be a, a humble, needy people, reliant uh, Christ on you, on, on your strength, on the grace that you supply. And we know that you, are, you will empower us, that you will strengthen us, even in hardship, even as parents watch children make bad decisions, even turn away from the faith, that you would give them strength, that you would give them confidence, that you would give them confidence in your word and in your character, that you are good and you do good. So I pray that we would submit ourselves, Jesus, under your authority, and your authority is a good authority. You are a good shepherd. You watch over us and you care for us and you guide us and you love us. So I pray that we would remember again your love for your people and that we would demonstrate to our kids, to our children, that love, the love that we have experienced in you, that they would experience an overflow of love from us. And we do pray for the salvation of the children, a great salvation in this church, just as a testimony to your grace, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.